Russell Campbell. How are you? Now, just briefly, I, I don't want to dwell on it, but you, were you brought up in Wellington? Yeah, yeah. And you went to school here, of course. Yeah. Whereabouts? Well, I <coughs> went to school at um, Kelvin, Kelvin okay. oh, okay. School. So I lived in Karori. And then we moved up to the hut, and I went to Hutt Valley High School. Okay. So, but where I really want to get started is, after being, you'd gone to like Victoria University of Wellington? Yes, yeah. Did a BA there or? Yeah. In what, English? English or? and whole side. Right, because you couldn't do film back then. No. And then you went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Well, hang on, hang on. Before that I went to film school in, in London. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, does that give you a BFI connection <laughs> later? Uh, well, we'll get to that later anyway. Yeah. So, so what was the film school in London? That was the, what was called the London School of Film Technique at that oh, time. Okay. It's now the London Film School. Okay. And I did a year there. It was all I could afford, and got an intermediate certificate. And up, but you know, I went off to Greece for a while. And when I got back to London, I got a job through the film school, uh, editing these textbooks on. Um, like BFI? Um, uh, no, well, nothing to do with BFI. Okay. Um, it was an <coughs> outfit called Tentivy Press and they wanted to start a series of textbooks on film technique. <coughs> so they got me in as an editor and the first um, books they wanted to do were on cinematography. And they said, well, you know, get a leading DOP to, to write the books. They wanted one on theory, one on practice. I said, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> how much are you going to pay them? They said, oh, we've got a budget of £500. And I said, well, DOP gets about that for a week's work, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get someone to write a book for, a cinematographer to write a book for 500 quid. So they said, oh, you can write them, can't you? <laughs> I said, okay. So I did a couple of t uh, two textbooks for them. And they became like plastic handbooks, didn't they? Like, Well, they sold quite well, yeah, because yeah. I kept on getting... Royalty papers right through the 70s is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. I wonder if people still use them. Uh, I don't Does think so anymore. Okay. <laughs> Historical. And so from there... So then, then I went, then then I went, to, went Wisconsin. to Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. A hotbed of student radicalism oh, was, in the 60s. Yeah. And, when you were there? Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah um, just before I got there in August 1970, they had the Army Math Research bombing which was, because um, uh, it was a research centre doing, um, you know, doing mathematical research for the, for the military. <coughs> the New Year's gang went in and um, set off a bomb in the middle of the night. Wow. Unfortunately, there was one researcher working there yeah, who got killed. Yeah. Um, but they'd been running battles with the National Guard uh, several months earlier. Um, during the after the invasion of Cambodia by Nixon. Oh yeah, it was it, well in seventy two was the only city in the country that voted for McGovern apart from Washington DC. Uh, everyone else voted for Nixon, seventy two. Right. And I had heard, I don't know whether it's true or not, that there was a communist mayor in, in Madison. Well I don't know how communist he was, but Paul Soglin, yeah, yeah, he was yeah. Uh, he was very much the left. Left wing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah instead of a Memorial Day, you know, like our um, Anzac Day stuff. Instead of doing that, he, he <laughs> went to a park and had an anti-war um, rally. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Those u university cities, the you know, Ann Arbor, Madison, Boulder, Colorado. I mean, they're all quite interesting, aren't they? Oh yeah. You know, little oases in America. And you were involved with the Velvet Light Trap, a, a film publication in Madison? Yeah, I, found, I founded that. You founded the Velvet Light oh, Trap? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, um, there was a tremendous film culture in Madison. Right. There were like 30 film societies on campus. People were just mad about films. And, um, wow. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, let's have, let's have a magazine. So, And I was doing studying films, so I had... Yeah. You know, uh, fellow students who are writing good stuff, you know, good essays. Oh, well, we'll yeah. You wrote your rather scurrilous eight notes on the underground. <laughs> scurrilous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, when you were there, you tutored James Benning. Oh, 
I did. <laughs> then a couple of years later, I was better when I was at Northwest and he tutored me. <laughs> right. So you both went from Madison to um, to Northwestern and Evanston, Illinois. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and you did your PhD there. You'd done like an MA in, in medicine? Yeah, yeah. And what was your, your PhD research? What was that concerned with? That was, uh, I was looking into <coughs> workers' film and photo league, which later dropped the workers, and just became the film and photo league, right. and Nikino, which was uh, the New York collective of filmmakers, and that which then became Frontier Films. So so it was looking at those three groups then right. in the 30s. Active in the, the 1930s, yeah. yeah. I've, it occurred to me later, and you've never seen it in any history of a American or Canadian avant-garde cinema, but they really are the precursors to the, to the artist-run film co-op movement that came in the 60s, you know. Yeah, particularly, particularly, particularly Nikino. Because yeah. they were really they, the uh, workers' film fellow league was very much uh, politically oriented. Nike, you know, was much more more aesthetic. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah, with people like uh, uh, Ralph Steiner, Paul Strand, I think, got involved. Yeah. Native land. Yes, yeah, nineteen forty-two. Sort of production of frontier yeah. films. They spent years doing that. Right, I read, and I had yeah. like Ilya Kazan, and you know. Well, cause, yeah, Kazan was there for a while. Then, yeah. Then he uh, left. He did. Um, yeah, the people of Cumberland was very much Kazan's film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the fact that they were treated with suspicion, like, because they were New York Jews. Oh, you know. Right, yes, yeah. But um, but it's that sort of film, like Native Land, it seems particularly apt for the current situation in the United States and Brazil. Where they, you know, for them the 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 motivating issue was uh, democracy versus fascism, rather than the say communism and capitalism. You know, and this seems to be the issue that we're facing again. Yeah, oh, you know? this could be a parallel. There. Yeah. Of course, the democracy versus fascism that was the that was the what they called the People's Front Line of the Communist Party at the time. Right. It's international. Right. Um, yeah, out of science. So. And that, uh, did the workers' uh, film and photo league, did that have anything to do with the federal art project, you know, which had funded in the in the yeah. R Roosevelt era all these writers and artists, muralists? Yeah, no, because the, the different periods. The workers' film and photo league really, uh, well, it, it survived until 1936 and then it became just the photo league. Yeah. Um, and the Federal Art Project really, you know, didn't get off until about 36, 37. So sort of the Federal Art Project came along afterwards, really. And, and the Photo League, they would have had, like, equipment pools so that basically you could go there and you could get, like, filmmaking, 16 millimeter, I imagine, filmmaking and sound equipment, lights, etc. And for a nominal fee or no fee, take that out and then make your yeah. film. Is that how it worked? Yeah, I'm not so sure. I know they didn't have a lot of equipment. Um, yeah. And they were... I think they worked quite a bit in 35mm, silent 35mm, right. because they wanted their film shown in the cinemas. There was yes. not much 16mm uh, um, right. right. projection in those days. And the budgets, like I saw something like 40,000 US dollars for a native land, I mean, oh, well, that's a lot of money. Native, native, that's, that's frontier films, that's highly oh, Okay, that's sorry, different. sorry. Yeah, because yeah, uh, film and uh, works from photo lead, yeah, they, 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 they survived on practically nothing. They had a bit of money from through the communist movement, yeah. Probably. That was from the Russian Communist Party? or, or? Uh, well, No, it was through, through the WIO, the Works of National Relief. Right. Um, well, the money eventually uh, yeah, came from came from Moscow, but uh, yeah, there was not not much of it. Right. Yeah. Obviously. Um, but Native Man, I mean, well, that was made by Frontier Films, and that was different. That was uh, that was a sort of type collective of what they wanted to be professional filmmakers. They wanted yes. so, so they raised money from from these really wealthy sort of supporters, yeah. Native Man supporters. Yeah. And what about people of the Cumberland? Well, that was, was that was Frontier Films too. That was 1938, was yeah, it? I, think so. yeah. I remember you saying in 
one of the articles that I had read that you'd written about them that, uh, you know, at times they tried to mix documentary with drama and the yes. dramatic elements were never quite successful. Is that... Um, what I felt in seeing, seeing those films, particularly Netherland and again in the 70s, was that uh, the documentary aspects were quite fascinating, but the, the dramatic elements, um, well, they were quite well done, but yeah. they didn't, uh, out, you know, from a, in a later generation, they didn't mean a hell of a lot. Right, right. It seems to be a very forgotten part of film history. You know, when you look at conventional film histories and that you go through and it'll all be like Hollywood stuff. They're quite critical of Hollywood representation, aren't they? You know, the fact that they really didn't, you know, Hollywood didn't really portray their, their struggles of minorities or working class people, no, you know, very accurately. No. Although I must say, I've looked at a lot of 50s American films, Western and that, and their coverage of Mexicans, Mexican characters, is quite extensive, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, quite often they have Spanish, you know, just thrown in, just, you know, it seems to be more enlightened than, than later periods, you know. Well, one of the... Uh and the film affair really did a lot of things apart from making films, and, and one of the things was um, uh, promoting uh, sort of literal criticism of Hollywood movies. Right, right. Potemkin, they would bring in Harry Potemkin. Harry wouldn't they? Potemkin, yeah, yeah, yeah. The film he, was, he was sort of associated with the film affair, yeah. Yes, and you, you wrote, you, a book came out and you reviewed it. Yeah. You know, and. You, what was it that appealed to you about his writing or about his critical well, he perspective? Was, he, he was one of the very few uh, film critics at the time was, that was trying to be consistently Marxist. Yes, yes. Um, and his, his, his writing is quite variable, but some of it is very penetrating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, unique, really, you know, because especially after the Second World War, politics seems to. Uh, mysteriously disappear from American art. And you think about people <laughs> like Jackson Pollock and that, who were employed on the federal art project doing social projects, you know, or even, you know, with social component. That was jettisoned pretty soon after World War Two, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, the, 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 uh, that federal art project came under a huge attack from the Republicans from the, from the start, really. Yes, yes. And, and couldn't survive very long. Mm. You wrote you wrote for many publications, Jump Cut, Sight and Sound, and covering figures such as uh, Jean Luc Godard, Jacques Rivette, Louis Bunel, Bunuel, and various others. Apart from writing about aspects of New Zealand film, with the representation of the Pakeha male, yeah. I remember in Early Illusions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, your book on New Zealand documentary observations. You had, I recall an article in Illusions about something like eight notes on documentary in New Zealand. Do you remember? Um, there's no, I don't think I did something like that in, in Illusions. What I, I, I um, published a thing called Eight Documentaries, which was yeah. the uh, a chapter in that uh, book on film in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Oh, okay, Jan Boringer and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Dennis, Jonathan Dennis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then Victoria I, University then I, then I uh, uh, put it in this book too, so oh, okay. the first chapter in that. So this is the observation, so just put that there. <laughs> <laughs> Publishing, it must be a nightmare, getting publishers. Mm, well, it depends, it depends. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's theirs, sometimes it's easy. How many books have you written? I mean, I have no idea. I know you've written, or you're consistently writing books, mainly about film. Yes, well, six if you count the, um, the two books which I, the textbooks which I supposedly compiled and edited, but I yeah. actually wrote, yeah, yeah, so six books. Yeah. That's the, the uh, handbooks. Yes, yeah. Following being at Evanston, Illinois, you returned to New Zealand. Yeah. Why? <laughs> uh, I couldn't get into uh, baseball and uh, American football. Oh, okay. I was missing yeah. the rugby and the cricket. Right. 
and the beach. But so you came back here and then, when did you come back? What year? 78. 78 and like, was it 79 you helped form Vanguard Films yeah. with um, Rod Prosser and Alistair Barry? That's right. A filmmaking collective. Yes. Almost like a co-op but, but um, independent, more independent in a way. You know? Yeah, there, there was a filmmaker's co-op in Wellington at that well, time, sort of, you know, sort of um, not all that active, but the you know, equipment was uh, yeah. lent. So now with Vanguard Films, you went, produced a lot of films, or a few films, that, that um, could they be called working class films, or workers' films, films that presented a a partisan but truthful view, a people's view, you know, a film like A Century of Struggle in 1981, the history of the New Zealand Seamen's Union. Yeah. Wildcat, 1981, Timber Workers' Strike in 1977, that was in what, Kinleith or? It was all across the, uh, the six sites in the South Auckland region. Right, or Waikato region really, is it? Kinleith, Takaroa? Yeah, yeah, they call it. I haven't seen those films since the 90, early 80s. I recall having seen that stuff on TV. On and there was definitely something ominous appearing in the coverage of the workers. They weren't portrayed very sympathetically, and whereas it, I think it was with Wildcat, it's humanist. Separate news right, yeah. before Muldoon got into them. <laughs> and then Islands of the Empire in 1985, which examined New Zealand's military relationship with the United States from 1945 to 1985. Yep. I remember one clip just talking to an officer in the New Zealand military. I think he was on an Orion or something, and he said that when they would dispatch a torpedo or a death charge or something. All it amounted to was a blip that disappeared on the radar screen. You know? that. <laughs> yeah, that was so great. And then I think you must you 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 accessed like American footage too, didn't you? Yeah. 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 It all those sorts of films were news in the sense that. The news wasn't dealing with these things in that in that depth or detail. And you know, and they wouldn't show it on TV. No. Yeah. Was Islands of the Empire was scheduled to show? It, yeah, they they they. Um, TV one, yeah, I think we actually had a date. Uh, we're going to broadcast it, but then there was an ex by the, the lawyer working for working TVNZ's for the lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. And of course the fundraising for that film was very interesting, wasn't it? No no corporations or millionaires behind it. How, how did you get the money to get that off the ground? Uh, we, we piled a house. Up near here, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah that's right. Because yeah. I know George Rose helped. <laughs> <laughs> Another Arrow Valley filmmaker. Now you also had some association with Meritometer and Gerd Pullman. Informal association. Oh, um, Rod and I worked with Geard on Kimmy Fatty, which was the film he made for the FOL um, about the Federation strike. of Labour. Yeah, yeah. About this, and this and the fourteen-week strike, mm. Kimmy, most successful workers' struggle in New Zealand history. I think. Yeah. I know Geard is such a overlooked figure in New Zealand film. I mean, that he made that uh, Hammer and the Anvil. Yes. Um, 
uh, Trade Union History of New Zealand, which was the first trade union film, wasn't it? Uh, well, they've been fighting back about the, the carpenters' struggle. Who, who did that? Uh, that was um, the infamous Cecil Holmes. Oh, okay. From the NF... I always say NFB, NFU. Yeah. Mm. Who ended up in Australia. Yeah. Fully covered in Illusions magazine. Yeah. Uh, now, what else did Ged do? He, he was, like, well, involved the, in Bastion the bridge, Point. The bridge, the bridge, yeah, the bridge. The bridge yeah. And, and uh, that he covered that strike on the Mangri Bridge, that long-running strike, which in which he discovered z that the guy that became the main actor in Utu, yeah. who was the union organiser. Yeah. In fact, yeah, we, we collaborated with you and Merito and Butter, we did a lot of filming for that. Right, there was like Wellington, so Featherston Street and... Yeah, yeah, we did, we did all, all the Wellington events and um, marches and demos and, and also Palmerston North and... The Austin, I, think. I mean, everyone came out, didn't they? I mean, Roger Donaldson, yeah, yeah. Leon Narby, yeah. they were all no, out no, there. Yeah. And you became a lecturer in film. Yeah. You were the first doctor of film in New Zealand, weren't you? The first person with a PhD in film. Is that correct? Oh, I don't know. That's <laughs> good well be. I don't know. People used to call you Dr. Film. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were. I think you were. Yeah. Uh, PhD in film studies, and so then you got, you came into the um, Victoria University as a lecturer, and you were there for decades. Yeah. Must have seen many people. Campbell Walker and that whole thing would have yeah. come out of that. You know, Alexander Greenoff in San Francisco. Albert Kane, I also met. And then quite a few of those people went from Victoria, and they did like a master's at Auckland. Is that correct? Some people um, I think Alex did, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't maybe Alex did, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because we didn't have a master's program at that time. Right. And you could actually see experimental films in that course. <laughs> you know. You occasionally came along and showed some for I know, us. So, yeah. I did. I got paid. It was great. <laughs> Six weeks later. <laughs> after much paperwork. <laughs> and then in the eighties also not to be content with all that, you were instrumental in the founding of Illusions magazine. Yeah, it? that was one class of one film analysis class we had in 1985, which was really good. Yeah. And, um, and I suggested to them that we could start a magazine, and uh, they, they did. And so they had an editor, but I think from the second issue, you were the editor for... Uh, from about the fourth, I think it was, right. yeah. Because um, uh, Reed, Reed Perkins was the original yeah, editor. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think, yeah, he, he did it for about a year and then I took over, yeah. So Illusions ran from about 85 to about 2010, I think, 2011, something like that. No, no, no. Was, did it go The last issue was about 2014, I think. 2014. Yes, and that was that, you did that essay about the representation of... The, Pākehā male in New Zealand films? Is well, there, there, were, really yeah, there, was, there, was, there was two. There was one called Smith & Co, which was about, uh, that came out in 87, that was about Pākehā masculinity. And then uh, there's another one a bit later, um, we're, we're dealing with uh, Brain Dead and the Piano. Right, right. Yeah. And since then, and apart from all of that, you also made your own films, such as Sedition in 2005, yeah. which was um, an account of pacifists and conscientious objectors in New Zealand during World War II. Yeah. And I remember one thing that struck me from that was that at the time in World War II, you could buy a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf in New Zealand, <laughs> but you couldn't buy Marx and Engels' The Communist Manifesto. That's right. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> Scary. I don't know if you ever heard that program, Men of the Angry Thirties. It was on a concert program when it was no. still 1YC, 2YC back in the 70s. Uh, James McNeish did it. Oh, yeah. And one of the people he interviewed was Colin Scriminger. Yeah. And he detailed how 
Peter Fraser tried to press gang him into the New Zealand army and basically put him on the front lines to get killed. You know, this sort of radio talk show host would be today, you know, yeah, but a left-leaning yeah. Methodist sort of Christian. Well, what was the other point of that film, Sedition? How we must always guard ourselves against the injustices of governments. Yeah. And I guess the Peter Fraser story comes right into that. Yeah. And poor, poor old John A. Lee. Yeah. And then in 2009, you made Sisters from Siberia. A, a single woman, I think, in, who lives in the Arrow Valley, yeah. adopts two girls from a children's home in Siberia and brings them to New Zealand. And to live next door. Then. Oh, your next door neighbour. Mm. This great little community around here. <coughs> oh yes. I know. Last time I was here, you gave me a copy, but I was staying with Sally Jackman, and she came, and she mistakenly thought that you had given it to her. And I'm such a gentleman, <laughs> you know. <I> <laughs> Sisters oh, well, from I'll Siberia. Give, I'll give you another one. No, because I'm moving, so I can't, you know, I'm <laughs> divesting myself of everything, of all material. Um, and the books, how, I mean, there's, there's six books, most recently, Codename Intelligentsia, 2018, about the English filmmaker, communist and spy Ivor Montague who had associations with the likes of the Russian filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein and Charles Chaplin in yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what a remarkable figure, you know, yeah. instrumental in world table tennis, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. you know. And, but I would like to talk about him a little bit because, you, you know, I got the feeling when I was reading your book, I, it was so sort of frustrating because you thought, well, why didn't you just be a filmmaker all the time? You had such obvious ability yeah. you know there were things that he, he could have done he set up the film society movement in in england and was instrumental in bringing in russian films particularly to england mm. and having them distributed and screened widely quite often under police surveillance yeah. and supporting the work of Len Lai. yeah supported Len Lai's work yeah. if you want to take a really narrow view of it <laughs> but uh you know, I don't know if there was. He was probably quite a good editor. I don't know. I don't know that he was a particularly good director. I mean, so, right. his, uh, the, like um, he did script work too. He did script work. Yeah. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, he was a jack of all trades and master right. of none. Right? And he had a great understanding because of his experience in England and in Hollywood. You know. Yeah, um, I think he was a very good producer, actually. Yeah. yeah with he produced Hitchcock's. Uh, four of Hitchcock's thrillers and uh, I think he was very instrumental in Hitchcock's career at that time. Mm. There was a question which I forgot so and it seemed important at the time um, we'll just wait because something came to mind about him but we'll go on to the the floor you know that this guy who was oh I know that, you know, he went to Spain with Norman McLaren. He did. <laughs> you know, that's a little known thing, you know, that that, that Norman McLaren was in the Communist Party. He was yeah. a communist. And, yeah, and Scottish he, Communist Party. Yeah. Had he gone to to, uh, to Spain with, with uh, Ivor Montague and they produced, they shot stuff, but they also collaged a lot of work, didn't they? Yeah. They'd get, like, Russian newsreels and stuff yeah. and, like... Yeah. Put stuff all together. Yeah, Defense of Madrid is not a very good film, but it's uh, they did it in great, great speed. Unlike yes. bloody you know, the frontier films people, where it yeah. took years yeah. and years yeah. perfecting their work. By which time the political, um, um, you know, Im impact was lost. Yeah, but Defense of they they shot that in November and it was out before Christmas. Right, I mean, right. It's incredible. But he became such a sop for the Russian Communist Party. Yeah. So uncritical, you know, and that, you know, whichever way Stalin went, Montague followed, yeah. you know. I was expecting that it would be a gradual process, but in my research, it, it really, it just, it just happened overnight, really, after he, after he joined the party. Yeah. He sort of gave up any independent thinking. Before, they'd been quite cr critical of the party. You know? yeah. yeah, independent thinking in regards to the Communist Party. My theory of it is this. You know, I thought about it a lot, like, why, how, you know, it's, 
and it's the stuff of a film, isn't it? Y you know, what a great character. But um, it's the aristocratic sort of upbringing, the wealthy upbringing, and wanting, and but, but having a sensibility that identified with the common person, and wanting, you know, as he did in life, to enact and act on that, and not to be a privileged sort of a sop, you know. But it led to a, a slightly skewed vision, vision, yeah. you know. Well, uh, he was not alone. I mean, a lot of even you know, Meaning. Human, you know, communists from working class backgrounds became, you know, yes. part of Stalinists. You know. Yeah. People with great IQs, geniuses even. Yeah. You know, but Einstein and George Orwell saw it for what it was. That, you, you know about Orwell's list? No. Oh, yeah. He, he was approached by the government to, to um, let them know who would be reliable people... That, well, actually, they were trying to get um, the intellectuals who could purvey, you know, sound British values, and uh, so they approached him, saying, well, you know, who, yeah. who are these people who are suspect? So he made up a list of all the, all the, the known, all the people he knew were communists. And, yeah. Well, so all... they were blacklisted, they couldn't get the government work. Yeah, well, that's iniquitous, but he had seen firsthand you know, the communists murdering their fellow travellers in Spain. I mean, the history of the Spanish Civil War would have been different mm -hmm. if, if the communists hadn't, you know, wholeheartedly, in a wholesale manner, slaughtered socialists and anarchists, you know, who were their supposed comrades, you know, and there's that quest and grasp for power, you know. So, so it was that, that aspect of it. So, you know, I understand. I mean, he, of course, he wrote about it, didn't he, in Homage to Catalonia? When I first met you in the early 80s, you said that you were interested in writing a book on the French writer Georges George Simenon, yeah. creator of Magret and that. And now in 2018, you're actually doing it. Yeah, yeah, well, it's a project I actually started in 1966 and worked on, on for about 20 years and then decided I didn't have the time to do it. I had to leave it till my retirement, so now I'm doing it. Okay. So how does that feel? Great. Someone told me that you learned French so that you could read his books in the original. I learned French at school. But, yeah. Okay. Did you read them in French or in English? Uh, English mostly, but there are some of them been translated so in French. And I check all the translations. Anything I'm quoting, I check with you. Yes, I recall when I first met you, you gave me a copy of his book, The Man Who Watched Trains Go By, which oh, yeah. was an English film in the 50s, wasn't it? It was, yeah. What is it that appeals to you about Simonon? Well, he's a master storyteller, for one thing. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun to read. But I'm interested in, as a critic, I'm interested in uh, the way his books embody the patriarchal imagination of the mm. 20th century male. Mm. Post-war? Or post-Second World War? Or? Well, no, no. His imagination was formed in the early years of the 20th yeah. century. And... Uh, it's a response. It's sort of his books are full of anxiety about um, masculinity, and uh, the, uh, the I think it's a response to the feminist movement of the late 1930s, 20th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sit. How easily does he sit beside Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir? Well, he, well he's, he's not an intellectual like they are. He only mm. school at 16, um, so he's really. Uh, Class, but I think right. a lot of his, uh, some of his novels from the 30s really anticipate the sort of existential restriction that Sartre had. Mm. Mm. It's interesting. Dan Cullen. Mm. Okay, thank you.